and start out and say uh, just thank you everyone for being here this evening. Um, we've certainly have gotten used to doing these webinars. Uh, a few weeks ago, Paul Weckler and I and Paul Sally all did webinars on uh, our block schedule. And this now I think will be presentation number six. So Monday night we had a similar um, presentation at the board meeting. Today we met with the staff and then of course tonight's webinar. Um, I want to remind everybody it is being recorded, so we'll have this on our website um, tomorrow, so you can access it if you have to leave early um, or you just want to go back to it. So tonight the format, we're going to run through um, the presentation here, and then we have, as you can see, possibly uh, we're joined by a few other administrators here who are going to be helping out with um, pulling the uh, questions together, and then at the very end, um, we're going to do a Q&A, and we also have received some questions in advance, so we're we hopefully have some of those questions covered um, in the presentation as well, because I think we have an idea of what um, uh, uh, some of the questions are that are multiple questions. So I'm going to go ahead and begin here. Paul, do you want to, or Michael, you want to advance that? I think Michael's on the presenter yeah. view. Can I do it? Can yeah, oh yeah, sure, sure. Thanks, Paul. Oh, I see it now. Yeah. Yep. So I think the first, this first slide here is just, um, you know, it's, it's an example of being able to bring our kids back on campus to um, safely be a part of our extracurricular programs, um, from some clubs to some of our athletic programs. It's just nice having kids around. Um, and I just want to thank um, all of you who have, um, if you've had your kids participate and you know, our kids are doing a wonderful job of following the guidelines. It's not easy to wear a mask while shooting a basket, um, but, um, you know, certainly indoors and outdoors have some different expectations, but it's really been nice having kids on campus. And then, uh, you know, getting into our extracurriculars, such as our performing arts program, we have Lanyap Potpourri, which is, you know, in our probably 77th or 78th year here, um, but our staff members are really trying to think outside the box to make sure that our kids can have similar experiences. We know that there's some differences in terms of the way we will present Lanyap, but just the idea that um, we really want to continue to make sure that our kids have that extension beyond, beyond the classroom. So looking forward to, um, you know, all of our kids being able to participate in something that, that brings them joy and social satisfaction um, outside of the classroom. So go ahead, Paul. All right, so um, so welcome. Thanks for being here, and um, thanks for for listening to this, and thanks for thinking about this. This is clearly a really complex situation, and um, we are working really hard to put something together. and And the two overarching goals are there. Um, and and on top of that, I'd add that we really want to um, to get students in school, and then be able to keep them in school once we get them here. Um, and then we also want to be able to keep staff safe. Um, so, uh, of course, we want to keep students safe a as well. Um, but there are some options that our students have that we'll talk about um, that are different than, than what might be available for, for our staff if we're in, um, if we're having students in. So one of, our, one of the things we focus on is, is making sure that we have protocols around the school that are um, keeping everyone safe. And I, I just think that one of the foundations that you'll hear about is um, to all this is that we're, we do have and, and um, will implement a robust, a robust remote learning program. We'll have some students who can't be in. We'll have some students who, um, if we are in, may end up needing to quarantine for a period of time or we may need to go all remote for a while. So, uh, so that's a key part of, of the whole of our plan. And we'll talk some more about that. So Denise, do you want me to work through the? Yeah, the yeah, okay. yeah, Great. please. Yeah, so, so I think that the flexibility and patience that we need are, are really important. And it really does take all of us working together. When we think about trying to get our students in and then being able to try and sustain that over a period of time, uh, it takes everyone. It takes our students, it takes uh, our staff, our administrators and our parents to, to work together to make this happen. And we do need to make sure that we're being socially responsible. Um, we need to protect our most vulnerable uh, students, staff and community members um, with our plan. 
And um, we, we need to follow the guidelines and we need to follow the science. And we certainly are spending a great deal of time doing, doing that reading and that research and making sure we're up to date. And that includes talking with epidemiologists and other people in the healthcare field uh, to make sure we have the latest information. And, and yes, just worth emphasizing the flexibility and patience from everyone. So a lot of people have put in a great deal of, of thought and, and time to prepare for 2020, 2021. Uh, some of the questions that we've seen is in what ways will, will a remote learning experience be different from, uh, from what happened in, in the four, in fourth quarter? And we'll talk about two differences. One is that, that in fourth quarter, um, we had, uh, uh, it was sort of emergency remote learning and that we took uh, a, a day or two to prepare and had some preparation days in the middle, but our curriculum was designed for in school nine period a day uh, delivery. And that's not, that's not what happened. And I think our teachers did, did a wonderful job and adapted, um, uh, adapted well. We've now had time to actually put um, energy into that and redesign curriculum, do professional development, and look at the block schedule that we have, uh, we're putting forward in, um, in, a, in a more detailed way than we were in the past. Uh, so, um, so all that is, is really important for us as we know that um, our, our remote learning will be, will be different than, than in the fourth quarter. So this is this is what what we know, and there and, and there's a lot that we don't know. But but we know teachers will be teaching. We know that um, students will be learning every day, uh, and and that's our our plan. And and with that, depending on what the scenario is, we have lots of options that we can work on. Work under. So these are the three options that we're we're considering. Um, all students in school, which is probably um, uh, not likely. In fact, I, I know we'll have students who just need to stay at home for various reasons for the entire year, and we're ready uh, to accommodate that and make that happen. Uh, the hybrid schedule is the one that we've had to spend a lot of time on because that's just very different than anything that we've ever done, where we have some students in school and some, some students remote. So in that case, what we have is we have um, uh, teachers and students together in a classroom, yet we also need to make sure we're educating kids who are, are at home. Uh, but providing that time for kids in school um, to be with their teachers and also in, in the way that they can um, socialize in a, in a socially distanced way. And we'll also have to get to, um, we, we may need to get to all students remote learning. Um, I, I, would, I would suggest that that's a, a, a likely scenario at some point during the school year. And again, we're ready to do that. So our students um, will be um, attending school um, either through the hybrid model um, in school and, um, and at home or remote learning uh, at home full time. And the number two may be because that's where our, our plan is and that's what the situation calls for, uh, but it also may be a choice that our, um, our families make and we're going to accommodate those. And for our staff, um, you know, they'll be teaching through the hybrid model or um, if we're in remote or there are situations in which our teachers need to be at home um, for various reasons, they'll be teaching remotely at home. And again, that's the learning every day and teaching every day. So again, least likely scenario um, and families will have the cho choice for bus remote learning see if there's anything I missed. Most likely option for the start of the school year. We'll explain the way that we ramp up from no students in school to, uh, to a set of students in school. I think it's really important that we think about that ramp up. Um, our hope is certainly that that happens at the beginning of the year, but certainly um, even if we end up starting remote, that's gonna happen at some time during the year. And so that hybrid plan is so important. And it's important that students will be following the same curriculum and lessons. So our students who may need to stay home or at some point during the year have to stay home because of quarantine, um, they'll be following the same curriculum and lessons. And then as I said about all students remote learning, 
uh, it, it's likely to happen in 2020, 2021. And the way we've set this up is that we'll be able to um, transition seamlessly between these scenarios. Yes, there'll be some, um, a, a little bit of transition, but the way we've structured our schedule and structured the type of instruction and curriculum that we're doing, we'll be able to transition between those. So how will we decide? Well, there's a lot of information that goes into that. I spoke with us about this a little bit, but we're certainly tracking the current status of the outbreak, which is um, both in our, in our state community and school. We, um, uh, we have um, more information now from the state of Illinois. They're breaking the state into more regions and areas today and provided us with a little more information. We also uh, are watching very carefully the, the science on how the disease spread. And we all know that more information has come out recently and it will, a lot more information will come out between now and August uh, 24th when our teachers are in and August 26th for the first day of school for, for students. And also mitigation strategies is something that more and more information is coming out. And mostly we also need to be able to just run the school safely for staff and students. Those are the pieces that we'll look at to decide um, what scenario we're gonna use. So I, I think this next section, Paul, I think what I heard from some parents um, after the board meeting, and so if you can hit the next part of this okay. piece right. here, um, is just making sure we kind of decouple the block schedule from the COVID. Yeah. And, you know, so certainly the block schedule was created and allows us a lot of flexibility um, if we're in uh, the COVID and have to be go to remote learning to uh, learning in the school. But we also are going to a block schedule because it, it, it um, supports a lot of other things that we've been hearing about with our kids and stress and being able to divide up the curriculum. So we're moving to the block schedule this fall. Yeah. And a couple of weeks ago, um, both campuses, we went over that. And um, but the block schedule, it's going to work this year. We're going to review it and potentially we'll move forward with it even in the following school year. So I just wanted to make sure that our families um, were all clear on that. And then in regards to student schedules, um, we're looking at giving a student schedules through PowerSchool in early August. And I know that's been a question out there with a lot of our families. Um, yeah. So now what I'd like to do here, Paul, then is let's get into the block schedule a little bit and break this down and then talk about um, uh, uh, the um, hybrid. So for the Trevian, um, so can you go to the next um, piece here, Paul, real quick? Then I think there's another. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So here um, we have a Trevian day on Mondays and then we'll have a blue green day uh, which will be Tuesday, Wednesday, and Wednesday, Thursday. And so all school days start at Winneka at 810 and at Northfield, they start at 750. So that's a little bit earlier um, than our uh, previous current schedule. And there's no early bird classes on Trevian day. School day ends at 335 at Winneka and 315 at Northfield. And then a blue day will have class periods and we'll call where they're gonna be called blocks, um, which are one, two, three, four, and five. Um, and lunch will be put in period A, three, excuse me. And we'll get into a little bit more about that and what that looks like, but just stay with us now that there's periods one through five and on green days, there's periods six, block six through nine, and then an X block at the end of the day. And eight will be when a student will have their lunch period. So, um, the schedule is pretty you know, easy to follow. Those blocks are made up of 70 minute blocks, um, which provide for flexible instruction and it'll give us ample time for kids to be able to have their lunch. Wanna add anything to that, Paul, about the, the minutes in that block? No, I think, that, I think that one of the reasons why this block schedule is, is helpful um, overall in, 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 in school in general, but certainly during a time like COVID, is that there's flexibility within those blocks as well for teachers to use in, in a wide variety of ways. Um, we, we need to spend time learning about how this schedule will work, will, will work for us. Um, and, uh, and I think those, those longer blocks will provide great opportunities for, for, for learning. The 70 minute block as opposed to a 68 minute block or something like that is just to, to provide that consistency and ease no matter where students are, whether they're all at home, some at home, some in school, 
Um, so, uh, so the 70 minute box gives us that. So one of the questions that we have is the science day and what will it look like on a Trevian day and a blue and green day? So let's go to the next one for me. Yep. Okay. So a Trevian day, science classes meet for one 35 minute period. On a blue green day, science classes meet either periods one through five or periods six through nine for a full block and a half. So that's 70 minutes plus 35 minutes. So most often these blocks will meet back to back and usually in different rooms. So I'm gonna give an example here. So let's say your schedule is listed with science blocks one and two. So I'm gonna start with the blue day first. So example, block period A, you're free for 35 minutes. It's a 70 minute block. So the first part one of it, you're free. The second part, 1B, you have a science class in room 107 and it's 35 minutes. Block two on your blue day, 2A and 2B, so we split the 70 up. You're in a science lab room and you're in room 108 and you're in 70 minutes. So period two, the whole block, you're in a lab, but your first period is split and students will either be free the first or free the second, or, and, and class the second, excuse me, free the first, class the second, or vice versa. And then on a green day, your science class doesn't meet. So the, the part that's bold on my screen here, so period two is your science lab. That's what determines the period that you're gonna have on Trevian day for your science class. So on Trevian day, your period two on Trevian Day is when you meet for 35 minutes in room 107. That means your period one is free. So I hope that clarifies um, how the uh, block schedule works with science. Um, and we'll make sure that we have this, um, Paul, Mr. Weckler and yeah. I are going to be doing a, um, another short webinar for students just to have that will clarify a lot about the schedule. Can I just add add one yeah. piece that that one of the things that we know is true about going to a block schedule and 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 managing this is that there is some loss of instructional time. So what we're used to in a regular class are five 40 minute periods for the week. That's what we're used to and any any of our students that, that are on our parents have, are familiar with that and and the way we can think about this for a regular class and I'll get to science in a, in a minute is that there's a 35 minute period on a Trevian day and then a seven minute period on your blue day, which is sort of two 35 minute periods. And there'll be a second blue day during, during the week. And that'll be two more. So there are really five 35 minute periods that a student has in a regular classroom. One on Trevian, two on the first blue day, two on the second blue day. Science is used to seven 40 minute periods, right? That's the way we've structured our curriculum. And what Denise just explained is one period on Trevian day, period two. And then on blue day, it's actually three 35 minute periods. So it's a 70 minute block and a 35 minute block. So all in all, they end up with seven 35 minute periods within the, the week instead of the seven 40 minute periods. So that's how this structure came about. So, Denise, you want to do this, or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think so. So, one of the questions that we had too is, how are you going to? So, we're going to be getting into soon here. If we go to a hybrid model, and we need to separate students to have so many kids on campus, what is the way we're going to be separating them? And so, what we're looking at is grouping the students into two attendance groups, and we would do that by alphabet, and we would do that between both campuses. So an example is attendance group one would be possibly A through K. Uh, and those students would attend school Tuesday and Wednesday, remotely Monday, Thursday, and Friday. Attendance group two, possibly L through Z, would attend school Thursday and Friday and remotely Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And so we'll show you a little diagram of this as well. 
So can you click, just click the next button, two buttons, yep. there you go. Yep. So this would be attendance group one. So they'll be always going to school Tuesday and Wednesday. So September 1st, 2nd, 8th, 9th, 15th, 16th. And then attendance group two will be on campus Thursday, Friday, the 3rd, the 4th, September 10th, 11th, 17th, and 18th. So Trevian Day is remote learning with, for groups one and two on Mondays. And that first one will begin on the 14th. We're gonna get further into this schedule. Paul's gonna share a little bit about what all these days mean, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to be clear with you on the attendance groupings, when students would be going to school and when they would be remote in the hybrid model. So let me talk a little bit about starting the year and um, what we have in front of you is Denise just showed this, but this is a, a possible way in which our, our year would start. So what you can see in that first week is, um, is very typical that we start with two institute days and those are our preparation days for our faculty um, and no students attend. Our first day of attendance is August 26th and we're gonna keep our first day of attendance is August 26th. Uh, but you do see that the 26th, the 27th and the 28th are remote learning days. And the reason why we're doing this is it's really important that as we think about bringing students on campus, that our teachers have a sense of how they are managing spaces, how they're managing their classrooms, and they best understand our new health and safety procedures. So we want them to be well grounded in that before we um, bring any students on campus. So then the next week, um, there's a district planning day. Now the Illinois State Board of Education, in recognition of, of all the transition that, student, that, that schools are making, um, granted uh, schools five district planning days um, in which there'd be no students. Those are our teacher planning, teacher collaboration days. So we're gonna have one of those on Monday, August 31st, in possible anticipation of bringing students in that week. So you can see the way that we've done that is to take the 50% that, that are in that group attendance group one, and we'd break them in half. And again, we need, to want, we need to teach our students what the safety protocols are. They need to get a sense of how to be in the space. Um, it's with fewer students so we can learn more about do we have, you know, is there any operational feedback that we need to make changes um, uh, as we sort of go through that week. So each student would be in class one day that week, uh, unless the family has decided their student will stay home. You can see that the, the third week then, um, Labor Day is a day off, um, and we either repeat the next week because of the operational feedback and we want to make sure that we can keep kids healthy. Once we have students in the school, we wanna be able to keep them in the school. We wanna keep, um, hybrid learning. We want to keep kids in school once, once we start. So we want to be very careful. And so uh, that week we could go to 50% and to the full attendance group model, or we may stay at 25%. And you can see our target for the week of September 14th um, would be to have um, our 50% of students in on Tuesday and Wednesday and 50% in on oh, Thursday, Friday. Denise, anything to add to that? No, nope. no, nope. looks good, thanks. So um, I'll just talk through this calendar just a little bit. There's a full calendar that's on our website. This only shows through December, uh, but I wanted to just explain a few pieces to it. So we are trying to at least give some lighter blue, darker blue, lighter green, darker green, so attendance groups um, can visually see those pieces. Um, and a blue day is periods one through five, a green day would be six through nine and X block. Um, and we'll talk about X block a little later. A Trevian days and they're 100% remote learning um, until further notice. Certainly if all's going well, we would start to think about how we could use our Trevian days to bring students in even more often, which would be uh, wonderful if we can do that. Uh, I mentioned the district planning days as well. You can see there's another one on October 5th. There's one on November 30th and two later in the year. 
we have some large events that we're sort of used to running, but are going to have to look different. And we're trying to decide on the format of those large events. So this one is pointing to parent teacher conferences. Um, at this point, we would not bring um, uh, lots of people on campus. So we'll, we're talking through what that format format should be, how we do that efficiently and effectively. And freshman go to school night is another wonderful evening that we have. Right now, we're just looking at possibilities for what that could be. Because again, bringing that many people on campus is, is not going to be wise at this point. In addition, um, you'll see some state testing days in the calendar throughout the year. The state of Illinois has said that uh, the senior class uh, must take their state SAT test, which they did not take in the spring. Um, and they have set October 14th for that senior class to take that. Now there are op an option to take it in April. We're gonna encourage all of our seniors to take it on October 14th. And as you can imagine with, um, with uh, all those seniors in taking a test, we're not gonna be able to, uh, to run school that day. Um, on the Winneka campus. Uh, we'll run a Trevian day on the Northfield campus and all those details are in the calendar. So Peter, I think Peter's on here somewhere, Peter. All right, Paul, what you want to just go through this hybrid piece then? Yeah, absolutely, of course. Oops, he's coming on. Oh, we have there to give him access. Let me see if I can do that, Peter. Excellent. Ah, there you are, Peter. Come on. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Hi, okay. <laughs> um, I can talk a little bit about the, the hybrid learning model here. One is, um, it, you know, explained through this graphic, you'll see a teacher in the upper left in blue that's in the classroom. So this is during a block where there's in-person instruction. You can see the students in front of that teacher. At the same time, in the hybrid option we're talking about, in the hybrid model, that teacher may actually go connecting with students who are at home and learning um, remotely. And you can see that you know the, the students, while in separate places, um, have a similar access or same access to the teacher um, and the content at that time. So the delivery model is simultaneous. For content and learning activities and engagement is an interaction with both in class and at home students and we know an important part of this uh, is the professional development around the technology tools and also hybrid uh, instructional strategies. so there are some real ways in which the instructional strategies uh, that teachers have in their toolbox will be um, will be modified enhanced and in some entirely new strategies to adapt to this so those are all things we're working on right now to uh, ensure this this transition to hybrid learning Similarly, teachers uh, teaching remotely themselves from home you can see that in that case that teacher is, is teaching online and uh, connecting with students who are in school on campus and that's their in person group during that time so they'll be streaming into that classroom uh, with teachers there as we have substitutes and staff overseeing those classrooms and then we'll also have students that online teacher the teacher teaching remotely from their location We'll also be connecting with students who are in their remote location at home learning as well. You know, we'll have this version of a teacher teaching out um, through the technology of Zoom and the tools that we've been using for synchronous instruction. So that's the model for the teacher who's at home streaming into uh, different two different spaces. Great, and talking about, I think there's um, call outs on there if, if we can help there. So more on the classroom here. So there's some elements of the classroom and the, and, and the day that um, I, I can share with you. In our X block, this is that last period of the day in, 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 um, uh, on, on their uh, student blocks. And the X block will have a combination of like student programming, office hours, and teacher professional development. So um, the important part of this is we know that you know, regular embedded time for student programming, for office hours, for students to connect with their teachers, um, and then also uh, having this time for professional development is really uh, makes for an important part uh, of an effective block of this time. So more details to follow on the calendar for that as well. In free periods, students um, will have free periods similar to the way they've had them in previous years. It's an important part 
of uh, students helping our students manage their otherwise very busy lives, that students will be able, they'll have free periods embedded in their day, giving them the time to do homework, talk to teachers, connect with colleagues or connect with friends um, and working on projects as they do that together. But they'll, we'll have some designated areas for these free periods to keep them safe in this way. Um, in lunch, you know that we're encouraging a uh, grab and go lunch or bring your own lunches from home. But the grab and go options is we work with our um, food service provider for enhanced food safety procedures, social distancing and grab and go lines, and then designated areas where students can socially distance in there. As the weather is nice, we're looking at outdoor tent when students may be able to eat outside as well to enhance social. Extracurricular activities, um, you know, as an important part of the school day's lives, and we're working to maintain these to the greatest extent possible as they're an important part of their lives. We're working with department leaders um, in that way to follow the guidance from IHSA and at ISBE. And then in kinetic wellness and um, music, two areas with a large number of students in large specialty spaces, working with, you know, um, not only following the guidelines in each of those areas and department leaders, planning for the opportunities for students in those, those realms. Uh, in kinetic wellness, students will be required to wear masks at all times. And then in music, students will, will also wear masks except in uh, wind uh, ensemble courses as well. And then looking at grading, if we could go to the last one um, in there. And in grading, if you click one more, in grading, normal grading policies will be in effect insofar as uh, students' grades will rise and fall depending on the degree of student learning. And there are some specifics that uh, we're still working on in collaboration with teachers, but more to follow but normal grading policies will be in effect. And those specifics are related to uh, the remote and blended environment. So, so there's uh, been several questions about the face coverings. Michael, could you uh, advance to this next one for us? So there's going to be three, three different slides here that uh, myself, Paul Weckler and Tim Hayes will be going through. And this is just on some of our work in thinking about the health and safety of our students. Um, there's a, a message there that says follow off signage. Um, we are taking all the necessary steps to make sure that we have communication, uh, that kids understand the expectations in terms of guidelines, but plenty of signage that's very similar to if your students were at a grocery store um, or any type of store recently where um, signage really helps you understand what the expectations are when you walk into a business. So if, um, they are required indoors unless eating or as Peter mentioned, um, actively playing a wind instrument um, and uh, they can be removed if they go outdoors um, when they social distance, but they have to follow the guidelines. Um, our special education department um, is working with students that have an IEP um, or a 504 plan uh, that they may have some type of a medical condition that may prevent them from safely wearing a mask. Um, so we're asking our parents uh, for a reasonable accommodation for a medical reason from uh, their physician and it would be signed and there'll be more information that will be coming to families in regards to uh, that particular uh, request. With social distancing, um, as Peter mentioned, I think that's just in everybody's train of thought now is what is a social distance? How far do I have to remain? Our kids will be reminded six um, feet apart um, in all those areas that Peter had mentioned in terms of the cafeteria, certain commons areas, um, those will all be uh, mark very clearly for our kids to understand where they, they may or may, may not sit, um, but just making sure that staff members are, are helping out with that too. Um, and like I said, any free period or their lunch, I, you know, at the Winneka campus, kids have a free period. At the Northfield, it's a little bit different because they're in their study halls, um, but certainly, um, you know, we're going to let kids, if they can, go outside, but just a reminder of that social distance. And then cleaning and hygiene, um, you know, just, of course, again, this is part of our general guidelines that we'll be sharing, but, and, and I think all of us are getting accustomed and used to washing our hands, using sanitizer, which um, we'll talk a little bit more about um, where we have some of these things located in the building, but we certainly have uh, plenty of sanitizer and opportunities for our kids to wash their hands. Um, we know that kids will be going into different spaces that other kids may use. Um, and so we'll have some materials so kids can clean their seat um, and we have time for staff to be able to clean in between. 
um, but just making sure kids understand that that keeping their area clean um, and we'll be sharing procedures for that in, in different specialty rooms such as music um, and KW um, and we're working with our custodial staff um, of, of course on all of those policies and practices. Sure, so I can go through these. Uh, thanks for joining us, everybody. Hope you're having a good evening. Um, so uh, we are going to have parents have to certify that their child is COVID free and has a temperature of 100.4 or less. Uh, if you have a child in summer school athletics, you've been doing this on a daily basis, uh, as, as I have for my own daughter. Um, so you'll be used to that process, but we will be doing that. Um, and we'll be sharing that with the entire uh, student body and parents um, as we approach the first day of school. Uh, Denise and I have been working with our uh, physical plant services uh, leadership um, to make sure that we can make the hallways and classrooms as safe as possible. Uh, so we have hallways uh, that will operate kind of like two-way streets. So you're going to stay to the right um, to go on to go each direction, and we'll have that clearly marked. Um, so it's very obvious, and you'll actually be able to social distance as you're doing that, uh, navigating the campus. Uh, we'll mark stairwells up and down when possible um, to, again, avoid having kind of cross traffic. Uh, and where it's not, we'll have, again, you stay to the right so you're not right next to the people going the opposite direction. Uh, and then to maintain social distancing in classrooms, uh, we've been setting up classrooms as, as kind of mock trials. Uh, and you can basically have roughly half of the desks in there. Um, we'll probably remain the other desk just to encourage social distancing, uh, but with clear uh, do not use signs on those other 50% of the desks that we cannot use. And then for uh, restrooms, uh, again, we'll be uh, using social distancing. So about half the fixtures will not be able to, to be used to, to separate students. Uh, students who are waiting will have a clear stand here sign as you're waiting to use that fixture. Uh, we'll have capacity limits marked clearly on classrooms uh, and those restrooms. Uh, and then the water fountains will only be used for refilling water bottles. Uh, the actual faucet uh, will be turned off or capped uh, clearly uh, marked that you cannot use those water fountains uh, for anything other than filling the water bottle. Hi everyone, hope everyone's doing well. Uh, so health services is of course an important part of our plan for making sure that everyone is safe at school. So health services will actually be divided so that any student who becomes ill during the day um, can be seen separately from other students who might be down in health services um, to receive a medication or for, for other reasons, injuries or, or, or things like that. So um, we'll separate those students, um, uh, contact their parents so that they can uh, be, uh, leave school and head home and then um, visit with their primary care physician. In terms of COVID reporting, so of course, as, as Paul just said, we'll be uh, every student and every staff member will have to complete a screening each morning and report that they do not have any of the symptoms associated with COVID and that their temperature is under 100.4. Of course, in general, we want any student who doesn't feel well or is, is feeling ill to stay home, but certainly under those uh, situations, we want them um, to stay home as well. And any case that we receive a notification from a, a family, uh, from the Illinois Department of Public Health or from um, uh, directly during that through that reporting we find uh, that there's a student who has COVID that um, those cases are all reported to the Illinois Department of Public Health and then we work with them um, to make sure that we're following the proper follow-up procedures so um, that includes things like contact tracing uh, to make sure that we are um, alerting everyone who needs to know uh, that they may need to um, moving to this to the ninth point there that they may need to actually quarantine. And so anyone who is in close contact with someone who has been diagnosed with COVID and uh, the Illinois Department of Public Health defines that as within um, six feet of uh, someone for 15 minutes or more, if they have been in close contact with that person, then they will need to quarantine at home uh, for 14 days and uh, follow up with their physician to and follow their guidance. And of course, anyone who's, who tests positive for COVID uh, will need to um, remain at home uh, until they have uh, met the requirements for returning back to school. And the Illinois Department of Public Health has a very set, uh, clear set of requirements for demonstrating that you are no longer um, uh, contagious with 
COVID before you can return to a school setting. Tim, that's really important, one of the things that you said that I think is part of the all together that we need, which is that, that when students are sick or, or staff are sick, they, they, need to, they need to stay home. And um, that is, it, it's really important that we, we all abide by that. Um, and, uh, and so that's where the good news is that I think this year, uh, our students will have a chance to stay up with their work in a better way than they did in the past because of how we're structuring all this. So, so we need that to mean students stay home and staff stay home when they're not feeling well. Tim, do you want to cover this too? Do you mind? Sure. So, um, of course, our students are gonna, going to continue to need support uh, uh, during this hybrid model. And so we will be offering academic supports. And we're working this summer, actually, to plan how those so supports will function both um, in this hybrid model so that they'll be available both in person and also virtually for students. Then we're also working this summer um, to prepare mental health supports. We know that um, the COVID and um, um, that this time is a really difficult time for our students um, and can really mean that they need some support for their mental health. So we are uh, working this summer to um, plan for ways in which we might be able to offer certain uh, times during uh, the day, during the week when students could drop in to receive some uh, additional support. And we're also working very closely with our community agencies. And we're, we're, we're very fortunate at Nutria that there are many very um, good, high quality mental health agencies that operate in our community. We're working closely with them um, to provide additional support for our families as well. And we'll update all of that information on the website as we get closer to the beginning of the school year on our mental health page so that it will be easily accessible to families. So I think, Paul, this next part is just, you know, our, our commitment to continue to communicate with our students and families um, and update through email. Our website, we have a very robust website back to school um, that Nikki Dizan has put together. Um, with a, you know, we've been putting all our information on this page. Um, you want to talk a little bit about the form, Paul? Because I saw there were some questions on. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, make sure to ask the ask the questions if I don't if I don't get to that on this so so we'll be sending an opt-out form to to families which will um, allow families to select all remote learning and we're going to do it one quarter at a time uh, so um, if you are a, a family and and you wish your, your student to stay home fill out that form and this allows us to make the logistics uh, work for, for students that we have in school. At the end of a quarter, you might decide as a family that, you know, you feel safe and, and, and your child can go to school. We'll make that change um, at the beginning of each quarter. Um, if you're a student or family that, that is in school and at any time you feel like you just want to opt to remote, um, you can do so. We're not going to we're not going to keep you in school if you um, or your family feels like you need to. You should be uh, remote learning. We do need clear communication around that, though. This is not we, this this could easily turn into the wild west, and we need to know where students are. So we need to know if you're learning from home and that you're checking in and part of the classes that that you're supposed to be. We need to know if you're supposed to be in school that you're here and at school. And, um, and so um, clear communication is important. The start of that is then the opt-out form for families. Is that, Denise, does that? Yes, um, yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay. I think that covered, I was looking. Okay. Uh, I can you keep mentioned going. The, yeah, we mentioned the student schedules early August. Yeah. I just wanted to make a comment about summer reading. I think, um, you know, most students understand their, their English and the level that they're reading, but we know for some of our seniors that had made multiple selections for a summer reading may not know yet um, which, which course they got into. So we, our teachers know that and they are well aware of um, understanding that kids will not get their reading probably until early August here. So just some flexibility with that. 
And I think that last point is, is just really important, refining and updating plans as conditions evolve. Uh, so much has already changed. Some, so much has changed since we gave the block schedule webinar in terms of uh, the status of the outbreak, our understanding of some of the ways in which it, it may be transmitted, an understanding of ways we can mitigate and keep our buildings safe. We know that's going to continue. And so as I presented a, a sort of start of the year plan, uh, no doubt that that could change, that, that we will be starting the first week remote. Uh, but then we just need to judge where we are. And, and we, we talked about the, the factors that were involved in, our, in making that decision. Uh, but we know we're working to, um, to update plans, to make our building as safe as possible, to make sure that we're meeting all the latest guidance uh, that's coming out. So I think I think that check Paul, I think that might be the last one, Michael. So I think Paul, one of the one of the points that came up and um, is, and I think we need to get a little bit more into it. And Peter, maybe you can jump on here. Is what is it going to look like if I'm at home mm -hmm. remotely? And I, Paul, you spent a whole day being a classroom teacher today, um, and actually running through this. Could you share what that would look like for parents? So if I'm a student at home and you're my teacher and I'm a blue day and I'm at home, how do I get my instruction? Is it Zoom, do I call in, video? Yeah, so it, it will be, and, and I know Peter has, has been working with a committee to develop this and, and Michael Morass as well, our, our CTO, uh, but it was very instructive for me to, um, to, to, to be in the classroom and thinking about how do I do this all remote where my students are remote and some in school and some remote. So yes, it is sort of a Zoom streaming uh, idea. Um, and the important part is that, and I think this is really important. The important part is that our, our students are gonna be going along in the same curriculum. Um, and uh, no matter what, the mo what mode of learning we're in, we've been developing that curriculum for our, our new schedule. Uh, and uh, I feel very confident that, that we, we know what we're doing um, to deliver that. Now, do I wish everybody was going to be um, yeah, in school? Of course. Do I want as many kids in school as we can? Of course. Um, but we do have a, a good setup and a, and a good plan with that. So they'll be streaming. Um, students are not going to be on, we have 70 minute blocks. Um, we're not going to be on Zoom for 70 minutes in, in many or most of our classes. Um, there'll be various activities that are going on. And again, this is the kind of curriculum and instruction work that Peter and his team have been working on. And I don't know if Peter wants to add a sentence or two or Sorry to. You're on mute, Peter. Good, Peter. Thanks, Paul. One of the things, I, if I can just add briefly, Denise, you asked how, what will that look like for students at home and how will they know what to do when they're in remote learning? A key to this will be um, really well-designed Canvas pages. So, you know, our learning management system in Canvas, our teachers have been working um, through the end of last year and through the summer on designing um, course pages um, and designing, working with Canvas to really have um, a strong online course presence. So that's the, that's gonna be the primary way students will actually know kind of what they're doing day to day, whether they're in class or out of class. So it's a combination of Canvas and then in-person and remote instruction. So that's gonna be a key to all of this. That's what I would add to that part of it, Paul. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so um, so I think you know one more Paul days of the week: Trevian Day, Monday, Blue Day, and Green Day. The days of the week. Yeah, so so Trevian Day, Monday, and you know the I think that the structure of the schedule provides us a great deal of flexibility, and there are a number of questions around Trevian Day that that we we fielded. Um, one of them is that we believe, especially for those students at our Northfield campus, that making sure you're in contact with every teacher three days a week um, uh, feels really important. And so the Trevian Day allows us to increase the number of contact days um, across the year. Uh, even, even if it's remote, you're still touching base with that teacher and you're still um, uh, sort of tracking your work. So I think that's really important. 
why Mondays? Well, Mondays are a, a day which has the most days off. Um, it provides some consistency of the schedule. Um, some, uh, some questions about why not Wednesday so that you have kids in and then you have a day in which you can clean and you have uh, then kids in. Um, we will be cleaning uh, in between every day. So we have um, uh, extra cleaning procedures as well as custodial staff that we're bringing on to make sure that our buildings are clean, our classrooms are clean, even between Monday and Tuesday. Um, that's just as important as between Tuesday and, and Wednesday. So that, that's why we chose Trevian Day as a Monday, days off, a good way to start the week with touching base with every teacher as well. So Paul, why is the school day 10 minutes longer with a block? Yeah, so we really, what we, it, it's actually 15 minutes longer because it starts five minutes early and goes 10 yeah, minutes. Sorry. So, so, the, um, so first of all, there's just some flexibility within that day. Um, it's, it's, it's only 15 minutes, but it does loosen up some time just a little bit. <laughs> and in addition, it, it just allows us to have an understandable and navigable schedule for many of our kids that um, being on Zoom at 11.05 is probably better than 11.02. And I know that people think about that differently and maybe it's me as a math teacher, the, the zeros and the fives and the regularity of that is I think something that our students can, can connect to. We also just wanted to make sure that we were providing as much instructional time as possible. Um, it's, it's my hope that by fourth quarter, maybe sooner, we're actually back to something that, that feels much more normal than this. And at that time, we'll have this uh, great um, uh, block schedule with these nice blocks of time for kids to, um, to engage in, in learning. So um, Paul, can you go into, you know, I kind of went through the block schedule, but do you mind just going into a little bit deeper about why we're moving to a block and the benefits sure. of the block? Sure, absolutely. Um, so, uh, so there are a couple things, and I, I wouldn't mind if, if sort of the block schedule um, graphic came up. I don't have control of it. I guess I could. Michael, I think um, has. But I, I can just I can just talk through it. Um, so um, so there's a couple things. So first of all, one of the so so there are a lot of schools that are on block schedules, um, and one of the reasons they go to block schedules have to do with the depth of of learning, the t types of experience that kids can have in class. Um, and, uh, um, and also the reduction in stress that, that, that these schools see in their students. Because what you have is you have a student, you have a, um, a student who is no longer every day of the week tracking seven classes during the day and seven, six or seven classes after school for what homework they had to do. Um, so those were, um, uh, those were important parts of it. So student stress is a big one. So now in the middle of a pandemic and, and with all the changing and things we're doing, we needed to reduce stress in fourth quarter. And, and we know we want to continue to do that now. Um, so I'm excited to see how this works for our students. I think they will see a reduction in stress. I wanna see how it works for our students. I think they will see a rigor rigorous and interesting curriculum. Uh, I think there are um, just a number of advantages to those blocks of time. It's not, you know, no, no one says that any particular uh, school calendar or, or schedule is perfect. Uh, this has some really good aspects to it that, that I hope will promote good learning, both um, in, uh, in remote as well as um, when we get back to in-person. And then Paul, what about exams? Um, exams being offered remotely for students participating in remote learning? Yeah, um, maybe Peter can answer that question. <laughs> um, you know, so, so I've seen questions about cheating and, and, and all that. And um, I think there's a, an evaluation of the types of assessments that we can do um, and, and are, are, are worth doing in, in, in this kind of environment. Um, so uh, we're looking at that very carefully. And every discipline, I think that looks different for for my math test and, and, and Mr. Tragos's social studies test. So we recognize the difference in disciplines as well. But assessment needs to be rigorous, but assessment doesn't have to look exactly like it used to look. So Pete, uh, Peter, I know you've been working on that. 
No, it's a, it's a great summary of that, Paul, especially what you said is um, assessment has to be rigorous. It should assess what students learn, give them opportunities to show what they know and can do. Um, and how do we do that and adapt to this environment is really uh, our question. And uh, departments are working on this department by department. It's one of their, it's, it's something we worked on end of the year in professional development. And it's something we've been working on through the summer as well, trying to identify assessments that um, can take place either in class or outside of class without you know, the, the fear of cheating or we, we have different types of questions that we can ask really to, to assess what students know and what they can do. So to me, there's some opportunity in all of that. I think there's uh, many that see opportunities in what, what can be with this. So um, again, this is the work that we've been uh, doing in curriculum uh, re revision work over the summer. So it's a part of that and still in progress is what I would say. So one of the other things that a uh, question that came up is, you know, that I think we should share, it's about have we tested um, this hybrid model and we have. And so we're doing that in our summer school classes. Matter of fact, we shared an example today with staff of a teacher teaching um, in the hybrid model and wearing a mask. And Paul actually um, was, was teaching today um, uh, math, I think that was, no, just kidding. <laughs> with wearing a mask. So, I mean, I think I've been really um, happy that we have several staff members who are been doing some of this now and that we can learn from. Anything you want to add with that, Peter? Um, no, I would just uh, only add that we've been piloting with a couple uh, summer school teachers and uh, we're continuing to work on that pilot. In fact, some of us um, on this uh, so we can learn and understand that better and um, we'll see some of that in action later this week. So yes, we piloted it, uh, Michael Marasa in technology and has been also a part of that looking at both uh, the hardware of what that takes for the equipment to do so. And then we're also looking at the instructional strategies uh, to help yeah. teachers uh, accomplish their goals in doing that. So yes, we have been tested. So there's some questions on here about, you know, teacher accountability grades. Um, and I think we've done a lot of work uh, in the spring moving on to campus, Canvas, excuse me. And I think that is just, you know, we've created some um, standards for our staff in terms of what um, a Canvas page could look like and should look like um, and really going all Canvas. Peter, do you have anything to share about just the use of that and how that will help um, and should improve students' access um, to instruction through the remote learning and even in school, in-person learning? I do, yeah. So we spent quite a bit of time working in, uh, in some uh, committees establishing uh, set of remote learning standards of practice. Um, and that has been an important part of what I think we'll see the difference remote and hybrid can be applied to that. Uh, both of those learning scenarios where we set um, an expectation for standards of practice in those areas. And also Zoom standards of practice has been very helpful. I know it was something that as we adapted to it in the spring, felt there was a need for establishing um, a set of consistent expectations across courses and across disciplines um, in doing so. So we have that in place. Mm -hmm. um, and then also similarly in can and for Canvas, we've um, es established a set of best practices for online course design and um, built into the remote and blended learning standards of practice is that we should design to those and teachers should design to those standards. So we should see a consistency um, across the school and also just more robust use of um, Canvas. Um, and I think it, it, the, the best opportunity for this is it's been teachers teaching teachers. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we have some super users among the group who've been able to um, really take the lead in, uh, um, you know, uh, teaching their colleagues um, how to design to the standards. So it's been helpful to design to those standards of practice in those three areas. Canvas, Thanks. Zoom, and remote learning and blended learning. Thanks, Peter. Um, Chris, if you're on, if, if I think Chris is on, can you come on in a second here? Chris, there's some questions here. And before we get Chris, Tim, I want to see if you can jump on too. A's. Um, so Chris, so there's some questions here about, um, you know, the, the air indoors, the quality, the ventilation in schools. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about some of the work that you're doing with our PPS staff? Um, I'm certainly happy, our, to, happy to address yeah. that. Uh, 
Uh, our systems were really designed to be as environmentally friendly as possible, which in many times means they actually bring in less outside air. So what we're doing is we're optimizing our systems to bring in as much outside air as possible. We're having windows open when possible. We're evaluating the filters we use in the systems. We're looking at UV lights in the air handling systems. And we're working to identify uh, areas that have been uh, brought to our attention by staff as, as having uh, air circulation issues. So all of that is, is taking place this summer and we expect uh, those changes to be in place when the school year starts. And then Chris, can you just a quick follow up to that, please? Um, you know, in some of our spaces where kids are in music, um, in some of those spaces that they can take their mask off and, um, you know, with, with the music area and just some of the um, droplets, can you share a little bit about the cleaning and what were the processes that we're using in some of those spaces as well? Sure, we're enhancing our cleaning procedures, both the frequency and the type of uh, cleaning solutions we use. So uh, as I think Tim mentioned earlier, we're supplementing our custodial staff so we can get into spaces more frequently and we can do a more in-depth cleaning. Uh, we're looking at the devices we use to spray disinfectant and to, uh, uh, you know, get that into all of our spaces, particularly high touch areas, places like music rooms. And uh, we expect that will have, uh, you know, be, be a significant help to those spaces. And there was another question someone said, well, well, if you're not using a mask in a music room, is there increased risk? And what we're doing is we're going to still social distance in music rooms. And that's really important for us, you know, if you're not using a mask when you're playing a wind instrument. And if, for those parents who have been in those rooms, we're very fortunate now, uh, due to our construction project figures. Yeah, they're large. large. Music yeah. space to be able to spread those kids out uh, right. at half capacity to, you know, get that, get that space in between kids we need uh, when they're not using their mask. Thank you. Yeah. And we're working very closely with the music department on, um, you know, they, they, their cohorts of, of schools are, are looking at these same problems. So as with all of us, we're, we're doing that kind of collaboration to bring the best ideas into Nutrier. So we've been working with our music department on what those best ideas are. So Tim, there's been several questions um, on our plan um, in terms of, um, a student testing positive symptoms. So can you, I'm gonna ask you a couple, okay? The first one is, um, is there gonna be an on-site testing for students and staff? Yeah, so we're actually um, talking with a, a couple of different organizations about what that would look like. Um, uh, different, there's, there are different forms of testing that test for different things. Um, and um, so we're, we're actually, we've, this week we've actually had, I've been on two different calls with, different organizations that offer testing and looking at what are the pros and cons of that. And what we would want, of course, is to really evaluate, um, does, does the approach, that testing approach improve the safety of our school? And that's really the bottom line. And so we're, we're taking a look at those to, to see what, what would really increase the safety of our students and, and staff and which one would do that best. So we're still investigating that. Can you go through then um, if, a, if we have a student that has symptoms, like what our, what our response team has put together? Yeah, so any student who has um, symptoms um, that are related with COVID uh, needs to stay home. And then what we would do is when that absence is reported in to the, through the advisor um, as we are right now, then um, that advisor would also want to connect that family with health services. So health services would reach out to follow up with that family to better understand, you know, what are the nature of those symptoms? Has there been a visit with a, a doctor? Um, you know, has any testing occurred? Have they been in, in any close contact with someone who had COVID? There's a whole series of questions that we would want to ask. We also want to provide families with support. Um, understandably, um, that can be a, a pretty uh, a time of real anxiety to, to think that maybe someone in your family is uh, sick with COVID. And so we also want to answer as many questions as we can. So that close contact is defined by someone who's within six feet, right? It's within, within six feet for 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay. Correct. And so, um, so what is the role then that the contact tracing is the um, county involved in that or how does Yes. So anytime that we have a, um, a confirmed case of COVID 
or there's a strong suspicion that there's COVID, we're, we're working with the Illinois Department of Public Health and then we follow their guidance. And so what they ask for from us is information on who was in the vicinity of that particular uh, student or staff member. And then they help us decide, well, who needs to then um, be isolated or, quarant or quarantined? And there's a difference, right? So you're isolated if you actually have COVID, you're quarantined if you have been in close contact with someone with COVID, and then they help us with the contact tracing, right? So um, we need to give them the um, contact information, the names of the people who've been nearby, and we um, uh, will help reach out to those families to let them know what's going on so that they understand what the next steps are. And then the Illinois Department of Public Health offers some additional uh, resources to families. So there's actually um, an, um, an app that a family can opt into that allows them some follow-up with the Illinois Department of Public Health. And then in terms of our reporting to all families, those families involved, to staff, what is the broader communication plan if there's an infection? Yeah, the broader communication plan is that we would really only be contact, contacting uh, families who need to be alerted that they're, they, they may need to quarantine or, or be tested. Um, it, during a pandemic like this, it, it, would, um, it would not be realistic for us to reach out every time that we have a suspected case of COVID because we would be potentially reaching out to the entire school every day to say someone might have COVID, you know? And so what we really wanna do is focus our efforts on those people who most are, uh, need to most be concerned, which are those families who potentially had a child in close contact with someone. All right, thank you, Tim. Um, Paul Weckler had mentioned the uh, work that we're doing with our PPS staff to identify the numbers of students in a classroom um, and so how many are we talking about if it's 50%, how many are we, are we going to be in a class if it's 25%? So Paul, I think we're at yeah, 60, so we're about, it depends on the square footage um, of the space. And right. I think Paul, you want to just right. kind of follow up with what you and I have been doing, the numbers. So uh, yeah. Um, so, so again, our you know our our basic classroom probably has 26 or 28 desks, depending on the size. Yeah. Some of them are really smaller, um, some slightly bigger. But we, uh, uh, Denise and I, have been working with our physical plant services, and we actually go to the rooms. We measure the square footage. We set out the desks uh, to see how many would be able to socially distance and still uh, still do that. Um, so I'd say our average one at Northfield ends up probably being. 14, um, probably the newer parts of Winneka might be slightly bigger. Uh, some of the older parts of Winneka and some of the older parts of Northfield are also slightly smaller than that. Um, so somewhere around there. And then basically it's gonna be half of that if you do 25. So for if maybe 13 or 14 is what we're looking for. When we have 50, uh, then we're gonna have seven or eight when it's 25. Um, so it might be numbers around, around that uh, numbers for the 25% the to the 50%. Thanks. So Paul, if uh, families choose to opt out, can you talk a little bit about the possibility of, could they come back in? You know, what, what, are, what is our practice going to be um, for uh, opting in and out? Yeah, so in order for us to be able to manage this logistically, um, assuming students are in school, is we're, we're going to need to know how many students are in our classrooms and uh, in our school. So we're asking, we're going to ask families to do this by quarter. And I think that here's an, here's an important thing to say. So if you opt out and you say we're going to do remote learning because of the plans that we'll put in place, um, we're going to have you commit to, a, to the first quarter. Uh, and then you can change your mind and say, we're going to, we're going to uh, be in person. If you choose to opt in and say, we're going to come to school, then at, at any point in time, if you don't feel comfortable with your son or daughter or you as a student talk to your parents and say, I, I, I think I just want to be at home, you can inform us and talk to our advisor and, and then we'll make sure that you, you, you can learn at home. Um, and uh, we're going to ask you to sort of make that commitment just because we want to be as careful as possible. Um, uh, you know, one of the one of the things that I think is important is is all the different information that's out there. And certainly, I've heard a great deal, especially when the American Academy of Pediatrics put, first put out their initial guidance. And 
we are strong believers in the need for kids to be in school and for their social emotional health, for their education, for their learning. So this is why we're putting so much time into this. Uh, but I, I do want to be clear that there's a big difference, and I think that the science needs to uh, be clear on this, but there's a difference between younger elementary school kids and our, our young adults um, in, in high school. Um, they are, are very different, very different people. And I think that there's some evidence that even some of the processing of the, of the virus is different. So um, uh, when the Academy of Pediatrics puts out stuff about, oh, desks can be really close together, that, that's, that's not for us, that we're, we're sticking to our six foot distance. We think that's what's safe. People will be wearing masks. Um, and that's how, that's how when we bring kids in, that's how we're gonna start. And that's what's gonna keep our students and community safe. That's what's gonna keep our staff safe. Um, and again, we will continue to look at, at the research and the guidance. So then, um, thanks Paul. So there's a couple questions, Peter. Uh, I know you kind of, there you go, a little glitchy internet, but you, we got you, yeah. So Peter, we talked about this when we first were looking at the block is, what do we do with some of these courses that are double periods? Like IGS, right. AS, uh, American Studies, um, right. that's a course taken during junior year, um, right. some um, resource support classes. Can you talk a little bit about what the discussion's been with those, with the departments and the sure. teachers? Yeah, it's, it's a great question because, you know, some of those back-to-back -back classes, you know, looking at, uh, moving to the block at 70 minutes and all of a sudden that back to back class is now 140 minutes. Some have been looking at that in departments, depending on the course, um, on the year uh, age group of the students, year group of the students, and then the type of course it is, have been deciding whether or not they'll continue in back to back, or in some cases we've scheduled them in opposite periods, like a morning and an afternoon class. And mm -hmm. then they divide that, that up in the, um, and they see each other every day. So that's going to happen in a couple different places. So in American Studies is a place where uh, the, they'll, they, they'll split up and meet in the morning and the afternoon the next class. So that is a sequential class where they'll um, meet those four days. Other courses um, have made specific decisions to say, well, they'll meet back to back in some classes. Um, and others uh, have broken it up, whether that's in support classes like special education, where they've broken up their time differently and they can see each other in the four weeks. So I think we've been really creative in our scheduling and thoughtful about meeting the needs of the students and the program in that way. So we'll start to see, you'll see that when the courses come out. So, so for example, American Studies, they think they'll break that up um, and then other courses may go back to back, so. Yeah. I didn't know right. the specificity of the question, but I hope that starts to answer. Yeah, yeah. I, I, the choice yeah, of, I, yeah. American Studies is one of those areas that's, you know, a large section will be broken up in that area. Right. Sorry, Paul, go ahead. You know, I, think, yeah. I think we have, I think we have a really good model with our IGSS program that, yeah. that already meets in this large block, right. which allows so many wonderful things to happen. So, so, you know, there are, we, we also have double period science classes that, that we've had experience with double period American studies classes. So we know um, some good stuff about how to use these blocks of time. Um, and I think it'll be some, some good learning. I think that one of the things that was important is that some of these support classes that are over two periods, uh, that, that does just get to be a lot. So that they, those get spread out in a way that um, allows them to get consistent support every day. And, and that brings up a, another point that I think is, is important. Generally, students will be, um, will be split into an attendance group one and attendance group two. But we actually know we have a number of students who, in order to access their education for all kinds of reasons, need to be in more consistently than that. So we have students with IEPs. So some of our students with IEPs do need to be in more consistently. That's something that, that we're, um, we're working through and will um, embed within, within our schedule. Um, but that's, um, that's, that's important for, for some of our parents to know that, um, that we're, we're working through that and identifying students who, who need that consistency. Thank you, Paul. Do you want to talk a little bit about the groups, Paul, group one and two? Is that what you were? Yeah. Um, you know, will they see. ever be able to see each other? That was a question that came up. Will groups one I know, and two? I know. 
you know, I know. We, we talked it's, a little bit about the group one and two and possibly doing a switch at if we're still in this hybrid model yeah we would switch groups attendance at semester so you you all experience a tuesday wednesday and a thursday friday yeah so so if, if we're in this for a significant amount of time at, at semester we'd we'd switch it um i think it's you know it's two consecutive days of learning no matter when in the week it is and and maybe it feels different to some families and maybe maybe it doesn't but but we do that um it, it, it it's it's not perfect that that you're in your attendance group and you may not be with some of your friends now you're still socially distancing at school and there's going to be social time and and that's going to be really good for kids but it it isn't going to be the same as what it was um, we're not going to be able to accommodate those kinds of requests that um, the work going on now to make the division work so that if we're in hybrid not only are 50 percent of the kids in but no class is overloaded um, that, that's a that's a tough problem so we're trying to do this alphabetically to make it easy for all of us to know who should be in school and who yeah. should but we can't do it alphabetically if it's going to end up overloading classes now i'm i'm optimistic but um but i just want to be clear is that yeah i think the other couple other questions that i'm looking here at are you know just which we've talked some of our specialty classes um like uh our our culinary um you know the labs glass some of those classes where um being at home is a just different experience than being actually in a practical lab experience yeah yeah that's a that's a challenge and those departments are are really thinking through that so one of the one of the things about trying to get kids in is in many of our classes they, they need that hands-on experience to to have um to really experience the discipline and i think you just named a few of them so having kids have an opportunity to be in once each week in those classes is really important and our teachers are working on what does that rhythm look like so that those days at home are also useful in terms of what our our students are doing some labs and some classes can actually be done um, it, with a, a nice video camera and you can look at um, whether it be um, a skill in cuisine or, or something like that. They, they actually use video cameras now to, to show some of their demonstrations. So some of that will be the same, uh, but our, uh, our, our departments are working on, on how to do that best. So there's a really a, a great group of questions here. One I should, we should have mentioned earlier, but after school clubs and organizations. So one of the things that we've committed to, so if you're a student that has, a, you're on the green schedule or you have um, your attendance group one, we haven't named it yet, we're working on the name, <laughs> but if you're attendance group one and you're a Tuesday, Wednesday, and you're at school, um, you know, you certainly would go to your after school activity. If you are attendance group two and it's a Tuesday, Wednesday, and you have an extracurricular activity, you can come back to school on, on campus at the end of the day and participate in that activity um, based on the guidelines that are set within, within if, the group. If you participated online in your classes, you need to have been yeah. in attendance yeah. right. as a remote student. Right, sorry about that, yeah. <laughs> we, don't, we, don't have the, we don't have the ability to provide transportation um, in that situation, and we know that puts families in different situations, but, um, but you'll have access to, yeah. to those on, on yep. any day they meet. So Tim, a question's about affinity groups. Yes. Can I, can I just add yeah, to, that, yeah. to that last response yeah. too? And uh, you also do need to complete your health screening. So even if you weren't in class that day, you do need to Thank complete you. the health screening before you come for your extracurricular activity. Um, right. So affinity groups, um, we're, we're, we will have affinity groups. Can you talk a little bit about what they are too, real, Tim, real quick, just in case some people may not know. Sure, so affinity groups are groups of students who meet together who share a common identity. So that could mean that they all share the same racial identity or perhaps they share um, um, uh, they're sharing they share the same uh, identity in regards to sexual orientation for example so um, and the groups are facilitated by adults whenever possible who also share that identity so the, the purpose of an affinity group is really to create a space where kids can come together 
and um, be supportive of one another, talk about their experiences, and um, and establish the kinds of friendships and and um, and relationships that are that are really helpful for kids to feel uh, accepted and and connected to the school. And so they've been very um, well received with our students um, who've commented that they're very helpful for them. Um, they will continue next year, um, and they generally meet once a week, um, and uh, they'll they'll continue to do that. And so students who are participating in school on that day remotely will, will of course be able to participate in those groups remotely and then of course if you're in person then you would just attend and attend the meeting and they run uh, you know the same kind of um, safety precautions are in place as there would be for any class um, we'll also we while we're on the topic too we'll also there are some support groups that we offer for students as well and as best we can we'll we'll um, continue to offer those kinds of support uh, supports for students too. So, Great, thank you. So, Chris, there's several questions here on transportation. Um, sure, so, happy to answer that. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, go ahead. Sure, thank you. Uh, so, we'll be uh, sending out information about bus service to families in the next few days. We wanted to make sure families first had information about the structure of the hybrid model so they could understand uh, the schedule, the times and how many days their student would be in school when we started the year before they made a decision on bus service. Uh, so that'll go out uh, in the next couple of days. So families will have an opportunity to register for bus service. Uh, the bus service will be compliant with CDC guidelines. The capacity will be uh, under 50 students per bus. Mask usage will be required uh, on the bus. And uh, the bus company has committed to enhanced cleaning procedures that follow uh, guidelines. We're also working closely with PACE and METRA uh, to understand what their options are uh, for students. We will communicate that to families and we'll continue to do what we always do to advocate uh, on your behalf to PACE and METRA for schedules that work for our students. But we also need to understand that they're seeing uh, reduced capacity during the pandemic and they might not be able to add or really change their service to add additional capacity. Uh, but we'll do everything we can to, to advocate on behalf of, of our school and our students. So with the white shuttle buses, Chris, they'll continue to go back to between campuses? Yeah, uh, so we're first gonna send out information about uh, the to and from school, the bus service, uh, and obviously special ed bus service will continue. Uh, and then in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about the shuttle buses. Uh, one of the things we're really trying to solve is right now, the shuttle buses, you just jump on, and we need a way to understand who's riding the bus in case we need to do contact tracing. So we're looking to, we need to have people register for those buses between campuses. Is there a way to sign in on the bus? So we're looking to see what the best way is to offer that. Uh, but I expect that there will be a shuttle in between uh, campuses and we'll have more information closer to the start of the school year. So there's a question on parking too. And um, so, you know, we, because we have now the two attendance groups, uh, yeah. our, we have Athena Arvanitas, who's one of the assistant principals on the Winneka campus that's working with our business office to be able to add more opportunities for kids and balancing out that parking um, for yeah. those two groups. Yeah, that's what we're looking at now. We're looking at to, to see is there, is there a good way to easily say, uh, if your student is in uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, you sign up for parking Tuesday, Wednesday, and then the space you're using is available for another student on Thursday, Friday. So we're looking essentially like, can we double our parking capacity by uh, having those spaces used by two students during, during the week, uh, which we hope will be uh, of benefit to the families. And we would adjust pricing uh, accordingly for that. So more information will be coming on that soon. Okay. Um, Paul, that, that lunch, one of the things that came up was that, that Monday, that Trevian, I, I, I don't know if Michael could show us the screen of that. I think this might be ending of our, of some of our questions, but really what is, what, what classes would be, um, where we have that, um, you know, lunch class free, you know, yeah. what classes might be in there? Um, how really does that work? I think it's important. They know that kids do not have to eat their lunch in the classroom. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so I think just kind of unpacking that a little bit. Yeah, we need to make sure we're clear about that. So um, I can talk about Trevian Day first. Um, so uh, 
lunch free class, we, we, we do need to make sure that when we're in school, that we provide a specific time for people to, to eat their lunch uh, because some will continue to access the cafeteria, grab and go. So, um, so when it's a student's lunch period, they, they can go in the cafeteria, grab their food. If they just have their bag lunch, they can go to designated areas to eat. They don't have to go to the cafeteria. Um, so uh, that's sort of very typical of the way the school runs. They also, because we need three lunch periods and fifth period on a trebbing day, everybody does have a free time where, again, they can go to designated areas and then they'll be in class in one of those. Um, and uh, we're just working the schedule so that we even out the lunch periods during trebbing day. Assuming, of course, we're in school, right? Trebbing day starting remote. Um, those classes will um, don't don't need we don't need that same definition when we're in remote learning for for that um, in blue days um, you'll see that there's lunch before and lunch after so that would be 3a and 3c um, we will not be having kinetic wellness classes be 3a we're not going to make kids eat lunch and then go work out uh, and uh, so they would be in 3c and then we're working with departments to determine um, teachers and, and, and subjects that, that work well actually for the class, then lunch, then class. I think that actually when we think about um, just that ability to, to, to get up and have a break, especially when we're in hybrid learning, if we are having this on 3B will probably be a, a fairly popular period to have. But again, we need to break that up in, um, in three lunch periods, and that's why you have a 3B that's necessary. Um, and, uh, and again, very optimistic in terms of how the master schedule is working for our students as we're starting to load that in. Uh, very optimistic about, uh, about the reduction in the conflicts that our students have had. Um, in the past, and we we love it when every student gets every course um, with us with a school of 4000 kids and mm -hmm. the ability to take seven, eight courses. Um, that's not uh, that that doesn't happen. Uh, but I think we've seen we might see a significant reduction in that from the initial data that I've seen. Uh, and then green days. Yeah, it's a different period. So one of the things our, our students will be will be dealing with that's that's a little bit different is they'll when they're in school on a blue day, it's a different lunch period than on on a green day. Um, and so gives an opportunity to eat with different people and 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 all that too. I think what would be helpful, Paul, is maybe I know you did this earlier today with the staff um, is we put together a couple mock schedules. And that by, might be nice to have on our back to school night so parents can actually sit down and we can say here if this is a student schedule, they can kind of go through that and kind of visualize what that looks like. Um, so I think that would be helpful if we if we did that on our back to school night page. So it's it's exactly 759 we're gonna be rolling into eight o'clock here. Um, but uh, there's some questions about, you know, the rest of these questions. We're going to try and see if we can get answers to those to those of you that, that emailed them to us. But um, Nikki Dizon, our communications director, like I said, has created a wonderful page on our website, Back to School. We do have some um, frequent, frequently asked questions there. We'll add some of these here tonight and we'll continue to do um, our updates all using the, uh, that website page. Um, and we'll add a, a sample bell schedule. I think that'll be very helpful, um, several. Um, so you can take a look at them. Anything else, Paul or Chris, or that you guys would like to add or anyone else on the panel? No, just again, thanks for listening. Thanks for hanging in there with us um, both in tonight and then also just as we make, as we make these decisions. Um, so really appreciate it and, um, and we'll continue our commitment to continue to communicate with, with students, parents, and families is, um, is, is one that we'll stick to so you get the information you need. Yeah, I, th I thank everybody for, for being here. I hope um, you hear the amount of time and effort that many people are trying to put into this. Um, that, that, you know, your kids really matter to us. We care about them. We care about all our families and we're trying to um, think through and do the best we can within the circumstances that we have. So um, thanks again for taking the time to, to join us tonight. 
If you have other questions that uh, you feel like we didn't answer, please you can e email myself, Paul Weckler, uh, Dr. Sally, any any of the any of those faces up there. You can email any of our, our panelists. So thank you everyone um, for being here. Um, right. Really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. All right. Have a good night.